everybody. Welcome back to the Psalm TV Podcast. This is Jason Wise. I'm excited to have you. On today's episode, we are going to talk about sparkling wine. And uh, that is a term I have to say because this is not champagne. This is Francia Corta, which is a region in northern Italy that I absolutely adore. If you watch Sparklers, you know that we featured Cato Bosco. And it is a wine that if you are looking for an incredible sparkling wine outside of champagne that will blow your mind, this is it. So I'm going to have Jacob Gregg on, who is like the knower of all things to know about this region. This guy is, uh, he is a genius when it comes to the wine world. Everybody, if you're in the wine world, you know who he is. If you take one step out, you know, he is a guy who drives quite a bit going on. And we're going to talk about this incredible region, this incredible house, all of these things. But I'm going to tell you before we get started, Francia Corta may not be a word you say a lot, but it is something you should drink a lot because it is criminally underpriced. And Cato Bosco is one of the places that started this entire region. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. Uh, we have a closer look at this region coming on Francia Corta very soon to Som TV. But if you're thirsty right now, you can watch our Behind the Glass on Cato Bosco. It is airing right now. And of course, Sparklers is up. So you, all of that stuff is right now for the taking. Also, I want to tell everybody – we have a new film that if you didn't catch it, Auction Lot 288, it is an incredible film about the oldest champagne bottle ever auctioned at Christie's Auction House. Go to Som TV and watch that. It is a tremendous story that shows you how long sparkling wine can age. It is an incredible story. So go to SomTV.com. An entire year is $49.99. And uh, if you're not a subscriber, why? Without further ado, my conversation with the great Jacob Gregg. Jacob, welcome to the uh, Psalm TV podcast. This is, uh, I've drank a lot of your wine and I just, you know, listeners should know that you, you seem to know everybody in this business. I'm not entirely sure when I, when we were filming Sparklers, I had so many people reach out and go, oh my God, you know, Jacob, Jacob is the nicest guy in the world. And so I am, I'm honored to have the nicest guy in the world on my podcast. Well, thanks, Jason. You're very kind, and and whoever said that, I I'm uh, sure I'll owe them something in the future. But uh, it's nice to hear. It was thanks. It for was your parents. Me. It was just your parents, well, really. That that's that's understandable. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So we're here to talk about a region that I think. Uh, well, I hope people mostly know about on a on a wider scale. I know the wine profession knows and loves this place very much, which is Francia Corta, and. It was a true honor of mine to have your wines and sparklers, but also to be able to share a little bit of knowledge with how ridiculously affordable and incredibly high quality the wines are in Francia Corta. So we had Cato Bosco. And uh, what I want to do is I want to start with what is the perception of this region, Francia Corta, and what do they make? Let's give us an overview here, which you are very suited to do. Absolutely. Uh, Francia Corta is quite an enigma in the wine world because when it when it was founded as a, a region for bubbly wines, which was relatively um, not that long ago compared to a lot of regions known for various types of wine in Italy, uh, Francia Corta really got its start in the 1960s. Uh, and, and that puts it in a much more modern perspective from a philosophy standpoint than, say, say over in Piedmont or in Tuscany, where many of the, the notable regions have been around for a really long time. So, Francia Corta uh, has always kind of positioned itself as a, a premium alternative to the wines from northern France, uh, like Champagne. A lot of other regions, if you think about historically going back 50, 60 years, the other traditional method wines or just sparkling wines in general were an alternative in price more than they were an alternative in quality. Uh, Francia Corta has a completely different uh, setup from a, a climate, a soil, uh, and, and clearly that philosophy standpoint than, say, northern France does. So it does have a lot of key differences. The, the similarities are that Francia Corta has the same grapes and the same technique as what you'd see in northern France and Champagne. But that's pretty much where the comparison should stop because so much changes after that. Well, all right, so let's talk about the grapes really quick because I, I do think that Champagne has – you talk about a brand, a brand stranglehold. Champagne is like Kleenex. It doesn't matter what it is. People call it that. And I, and I wonder, <laughs> we'll start with the grapes and then I want to get into like how much is that a pain in your ass or does it make it easier to market Francia Corta by comparing it? Because when you said premium alternative, I kind of almost, there's a part of me that went, why? It's its own thing. You know, I mean, I know that that sounds, as opposed to an alternative, it's like, why can't it just be Francia Corta? Why do you have to compare it? But 
Let's start with the grapes, because I know your, your brain's racing right now. Yeah, for sure. And, and the grapes are similar in that regard. So the majority of our region is Chardonnay. Right now, it's about 80 or so percent of the region is planted to Chardonnay. Uh, then Pinot Noir is our second grape. That's about uh, 17 or so percent uh, of the plantings in Franciacorta. And then we have a third grape that you'll currently see in the wines, which is Pinot Bianco, which was originally the main grape of Franciacorta, and had, now it's become a, a minority player. So all three of those grapes um, make up what you'll see today as Franciacorta, and all three of them are allowed in Champagne. That being said, you won't see Pinot Blanc in um, all but just a couple of, of Champagnes, as it's one of those four minor varietals of the region. We did recently introduce in 2017 a new grape into Franciacorta. It's both very new and very old. Uh, the grape is called uh, Herbamat, and it's only allowed in the future up to 10% at this current time. It's a grape that is very late ripening and very, very high acid, uh, which is a really important thing as we're looking to the future. Franciacorta makes very dry wines. The, the dosage that's needed in Franciacorta, uh, almost every bottling is, is what you would consider extra brute nowadays, under six grams per liter. And at Carabosco, everything's under two or three grams in most years. So having a grape that can bring acidity into the mix is, is something that will help us 5, 10, 20 years from now. That being said, you won't see Herbamat in any wines uh, being released yet, as it's just recently been planted and only a few hectares exist so far. Where originally, I mean, we should take one step back on the many, many, many people listening to this know how champagne is made. You know that there's a secondary fermentation. There's something called a dosage, which is, for for lack of a better term, is sugar put in the bottle that the yeast then ferments, creates the bubbles. I mean, you know, everyone's uh, heard the speech about the monks and such. But what, where did this grape come from? I mean, I, I've never, you know, I've never heard of it until you told me about it prior to this pod. I've never heard of this grape. Is it a native grape from the region? It is, in fact. So, uh, French Accord is a contiguous region that's just south of this small lake called Lake Aseo. Uh, this region uh, is is called Brescia, and Brescia is one of the most prominent towns in in Lombardy. Uh, Guys, not quite fantastic as famous food, as... fantastic food in Brescia. I mean, it is just unassailably good. So, anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, it, it it really is. It's something that we're we're not as known for internationally as is the cuisine of Lombardy, but it it should be more of a spotlight, and and I hope in the future it will. So, north of our lake. Uh, within the same province, so, so essentially the same county, uh, this grape had its origins. And we've even found some writings that go back to uh, 1564 uh, of mentions of this grape, uh, mentions in Latin from some of the local writers that existed at the time. So this grape is, is both very ancient, but it essentially wasn't in existence. When we found the, the, the vine material for this grape, there wasn't even a hectare uh, that was planted. So we had to also then take that into a nursery, make sure it was free of vine disease and things. This grape's been experimented on in the region for, for more than the last decade, decade and a half, uh, by the consortio uh, doing trials along with other grapes. But this one has really shown great promise. And, and from the testing that we did, it, it's going to really help us out, I think, one day. So it was nearly extinct. I mean, this was an almost gone so this is like this is one of the things I am the most excited about talking when you have these things and people shepherd something historical that was forgotten or I think that is an incredible thing to bring up with Franche Corta that it's that is why it is such of this place. I mean Champagne doesn't have this kind of incredible well I don't I, I love Champagne we all love Champagne but but it is just this is a story that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, French Accord has always been a contiguous area that's really focused uh, on representing what it is. And, and it has so many things that make it different um, than, than, say, Champagne. Soil's a great region uh, to talk about for, for what makes us different. Uh, when our region was carved out by a glacier that came down from the Alps, it originally, the, the base soil would have, of course, been like limestone and clay and these, these very water-attentive soils you see in lots of other regions that make bubbly wines. But our region is, is primarily not limestone or clay where the grapes are planted because what happened is when that glacier came in it pushed all of those those soils that were in the the, the ground initially up to the peaks and out it, it moved them and it left behind all of these large morainic remains these glacial remains so our soils when you walk through the vineyards in front Chicorda, most of them look more like chateau of the pop than like champagne so only about 10 or so percent of our region is a zone from a zonation standpoint is limestone. The major thing is that when you're growing grapes here, our soil doesn't retain a lot of water. When you think of growing grapes for sparkling wines in whether it be Spain or France or even America, you're looking for soils that often retain a lot of water. So the struggle that vines have to go through here 
is, is really quite different. And when you talk about finding a sense of place in a wine, um, minerality is its own uh, whole can of worms to talk about how it how it shows itself in a wine and whether it exists. But what you definitely get <laughs> – It's a very controversial the, podcast that we could do <laughs> separately from this. but <laughs> Very much. But what you definitely get is you get a sense of how grapes grow in our area. And when you when you taste French Accorda, you'll often see that, uh, especially the wines at Carabosco, are very much highlighted by the, the fruit and the, the brightness of fruit that we get, which is, is often then kind of showcased by being so dry, uh, not needing so much dosage. So you really see a, a sense of this place. And the soil very much adds into that. Whether you can taste the soil itself is is a non-question. It's just a question of how it helps the grapes mature into what becomes the finished wine. And so when you talk about this perception of Francia Corta in a world, this is a I'm gonna open up a can of worms here. When you talk about when you say, here is this region, would you like a glass of Francia Corta? What's the general perception? Now I have been there. I've spent quite a bit of time in Brescia. You know, you're talking to somebody who actually I, I do this on this pod where I always say I'm I'm nervous for people to discover regions because right now the <laughs> Francia Corta is so priced so beautifully. And I just, you know, the more people, you want more people to know about it. And I'm like, can we just keep the price where it is? Because <laughs> yeah. it's so good. I mean, especially at Carabosco, we really want people to associate us as, a, as an alternative in quality and, and not price. But, you know, it, we don't need to market as much because Francia Corda has a great situation in that it essentially sells all of its wine from every producer every year, and it does it in a unique way. You often see a lot of Francia Corda in Italy because 90% of Francia Corda, just, just under 90%, 89.7% last year, was sold in Italy. What other major Italian wine region uh, of notable world-class wines sells a majority, and at this point a super majority of their wine, domestically in, in their home country. It doesn't happen, really. Uh, French Corda is think. something that the Italians love. They, they absolutely love it. Um, you know, On that note, if you were to go to some of the great restaurants in Italy, the only French wine you'll see are the bubbly wines from northern France. You won't see all that many other wines in Italy, but they have this tremendous thirst in Italy for quality wines with bubbles. And Francia Corda definitely uh, fills this spot for them. Take into account that, that from a pricing standpoint, here in America, you're going to find the best Francia Corda is priced kind of like uh, some of the best wines from, from northern France at different tiers. But in Italy, they don't have the same laws. There isn't a three-tier system. The distribution method is, is much more clean. And you're not going to see as many layers of markup. So, so from a value standpoint, they look really, really attractive for sure. And that definitely helps. Yeah, you guys, you guys make a wine. So in, in in Sparklers, we were lucky to be able to play with two of your wines, Anna Maria Clemente, and, and then your and then your Brut. Which, uh, you guys, I'm telling everyone listening here, these are that Anna Maria Clemente is honest to God. I mean, it's one of the better wines I've had in my career, and not just like a conversation about sparkling. This is a tremendous wine. I mean, it must have been. I can only imagine the care that went into making it because clearly it's got age. It is. I, I think what I think what is happening, and, and you know, with not just Cato Bosco, but with other producers, the whole entire region sort of supporting each other and trying to rise up together is really a, a tremendous thing. And to see it in Italy, which is such an old winemaking place, and have such a new in quotes newish wine region because wine's been made there for a long time. But I, I wonder, I wonder what the American idea of Francia Corte is from your perspective, because I mean, Jacob, you're kind of tasked with bringing this wine to what North America mostly is that where you sit uh, the United States yeah okay United States I mean to me are is it is the goal of Francia Corta and we'll get into sort of the history and how the wine region came to be is the goal of Francia Corta to be um, like champagne or to be something where you could blind it and go this is Francia Corta it's not champagne I mean what is I know that's a tough question but what is the goal here? Well, it, it, there's, it's, it's a really good question, and, and it is a very tough one. Um, Francia Corda in America can probably never be um, known to the, the extent of champagne. And that's not because uh, of a lack of trying or, or other things. The, the numbers just don't add up to it. Francia Corda in a good year will make 18 to 20 million bottles, and that's over about 120 different producers. So that sounds like a lot of wine, 20 million bottles. That's how much, uh, effectively, a couple of large producers in Champagne uh, do just on their own. Champagne in a good year will make about 350 million bottles. 
a huge percentage of them. It, it's it's not insignificant. Uh, and I don't say this to say that that's big is not uh, bad and small is not good inherently. It can go both ways. Uh, but from a perspective of how people are going to come to learn about these wines, how often they're going to see them, there's just inherently less. And when you think that 90% of that production stays in Italy, that's only 100 or 200,000 bottles of Franciacorta that get exported to the whole world. Now, America is one of the largest export markets for Franciacorta, uh, just behind Switzerland, actually. Switzerland is the, the biggest export market right now for Franciacorta, uh, and then the United States, then Japan. But with those type of numbers, you're just never going to see it everywhere. So what Franciacorta is often doing, and especially what we, we do at Carabosco, is we're always trying to find the, the right people to, to share these wines. Um, the wines are their own unique thing, and very much like what you just said about the Anna Marie Clementi, they're wines first and they're bubbly second. These are great wines on their own from, from this region and, and from many of the, the great producers. They can be treated like the great wines of the world, not just like good bubbly wines. So what we're doing, given that we are never going to have the ability to grow distribution in the way that champagne has, we're never going to be able to market like champagne does just, just from this, this number standpoint, we have to go after the people who are the best. And, and when I say the best, I mean the people who best communicate this. You know, the entire role of a sommelier is to, to curate what the guest wants um, without them always knowing exactly what they want or knowing the words to describe what they want. You, you translate, you interpret for them uh, and find things that they're going to love. And finding people who can do that for these wines from, from Carabosco and from Franciacorta, that's very much the path that's going sure. to be the future for us is doing this in a very curated way so that those, those customers, those connoisseurs, those wine lovers who want to learn a little more can discover what really great things we're doing. So how, how the hell did this region near Brescia in the north very – I don't mean to say – I mean this in a very positive way. It's a very working – you know, people work hard in this region. They they have for a very long time. They're known for um, – you know, you get, some, you get some real weather up there. Why sparkling wine? Why is that there? Why, why here? I don't get it. I mean it's like why did this end up? Well, th this opens up a, a great little bit of history and almost trivia, if you will, that Franciacord has been around as a, a named – uh, area and the, the first uses of the words Franciacorta go back to the 1200s to 1277. But the first mention of bubbly wines was in 1570. And there was a, a writer who wrote a book in Latin, uh, Girolamo Conforti wrote a book and, and he calls the wines of this area, the vino mordaci, which means the biting wines, not the sparkling wines, but the wines with bite, the, the wines that had this, uh, so as it would translate, I guess, this liveliness, if you will. And they, they had prickle to them. So there, there's writings mentioning the bubbly wines of this area going back literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, even before the earliest mentions of it in, say, northern France. That being said, the <laughs> modern history didn't start until the... the that sounded the, like a shot. That sounded like a shot. I, I, no, it's not a shot. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting little bit of trivia because the reality is that we didn't make bubbly wines for those 400 years in between. Uh, the bubbly wines only started to really be made uh, in 1961 was the first release uh, from a producer from Franciacorta. And Carabosco came about a decade after that, releasing our first wine. That is wines crazy. In the 70s. I mean, people who know Italian wine to think, I mean, first of all, when I got, when I, when I directed the first Sam movie, I was told if you, you know, you have to make your way, uh, like most people entering the wine world, I was pretty obsessed with champagne. And I was told immediately, you have to go to Franciacorta. So in my mind, Franciacorta was as ancient as. Any other wine region, you know, come now I've learned that Barolo is not as old as I thought it was. And, and all of these things are not as old as I thought they were. I just expected them to go back to, you know, the 1100s or something. And they actually don't. But the 1960s is really recent. I mean. Exactly. You have to think about French Accorda almost in the same way that if you ask the average person in America, how old is Napa Valley? What are they going to tell you? They're probably going to assume that modern Napa Valley, as we know it today, existed far before when it actually did. I mean, sure. Robert Mondavi didn't start his, his eponymous winery until 1966. Sure. Uh, at that time, there was a handful of wineries in Napa Valley. I mean, there was, a good, there was a good history prior to Prohibition, but, it's, but it's, it wasn't in For comparison sure. to what it is now. It's just a different world. I mean, And Franciacorta, in that same way, always has made wine. It, this is Italy. Everywhere makes wine. And we made lots of still wines in Franciacorta before the 1960s. So grapes have been grown here. Uh, if you go back 
a hundred years to before World War I, there was more than a thousand hectares planted in the area that is Franciacorta today. So, so wines were definitely being made here, but they became famous, much like Napa Valley became famous for Cabernet Sauvignon, not just for, you know, whatever wines were being made and, and the vegetables and produce. They grew up in this similar kind of modern post-World War II era. And, and that makes a lot of sense in Italy because Italy was not a country that was mm, particularly thriving before the 1960s, you know. The, the Italian wine renaissance is, is what it's often called uh, over there, started in the 1960s, and it's this new way of thinking. All of the great producers that you think of today, some of them might have had their origins prior to this, uh, little bits here and there, but the greatest wines of Italy started to be made after the 1960s uh, from all of these great places. It really is, I think, one of those things that getting into wine, you start to realize. And then, of course, you double back and realize that that couldn't have happened without the prior history and all these things. What was – so Cato Bosco, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, really deserves a lot of credit for being the first producer that sort of made them visible on a world stage. Am I, am I correct on this? I, I we, So now we have the Behind the Glass episode, which I think is one of the most beautifully shot things we have on Som TV. It helps that the region is beautiful, that the people who work at the winery are – like incredibly photogenic, but, but am I wrong in saying this? Because that's why we wanted to do a behind the glass on this winery. Well, I'm, I'm clearly very biased, so we have to take it with <laughs> a grain of salt, but, uh, but I will say that, uh, I mean, Maurizio Zanella, who founded Carabosco and who, who you have featured in, in multiple parts of the behind the glass, our, our founder and president at Carabosco, he started this winery when he was a teenager. And he always looked not to what was happening next door. He didn't look to the, the other, couple at that time, not very many other producers in his local area, he was always inspired by the best in the world. Um, and in doing that, he's also traveled immensely and he's been promoting these wines, even if the, the monetary side, even if the sales that we had in America or Japan or other countries really didn't make sense for him to spend as much time promoting them in these other countries. He did that. I mean, he's been traveling to America for 40 years to promote Carabosco since 1982 was when he had his first trip here to sell Carabosco in America. And we only sell a few thousand cases now. We were selling much less back then uh, in America, but we've always been the one that has, has kind of taken an international, uh, you know, presence. And, and we've been really lucky because people have respected the quality of the wines. They've often been very awarded um, domestically and internationally with various reviews and things. Take like the, the Gambero Rosso Awards. Cato Bosco has more Gambero Rosso's, a uh, Trebi Carry Award, their top award, than any other winery in Italy except for Gaia. Not the most for bubbly wines, but the second most period. Um, so it's kind of a, a combination here. The wines have been uh, spoken of and, and promoted to an extent, but also it really shows the, the passion of, of the way that we were founded and how communicating about what we're doing has always been part of the DNA of Cotabosco. Has there ever been, you know, I, I, look, the judgment of Paris is what it is and you can pick it apart all day long. And, but has there ever been something like this with, with sparkling wine where people have compared it because I'll tell you right now, that is something that, from a standpoint, I know what it is. I, I know that the whole thing's, you know, fun. And But, man, I'll tell you that that Anna Maria Clemente would be a hell of a wine to put in a competition like that against the world's best. I wonder if it's ever happened. Oh, well, Mr. Zanella has done it multiple times. And, and uh, uh, quite famously, there was one that happened. I, I don't know the exact date, but it was in the 1980s. And, and he was at... Uh, a very nice Michelin three-star restaurant in Champagne, where he had a great relationship with the chef and proprietor, uh, who's not the this proprietor like, anymore. This sounds like this is going to go. I like this. And and <laughs> this uh, his his friend um, didn't make a lot of friends uh, in that day and the days after that uh, for for throwing in a few Carabosco wines alongside the the French equivalents from both uh, both Bordeaux and uh, Champagne that the Carabosco was poured alongside. So it's definitely happened. I would say that, to be honest, it's it's not the marketing approach we take from a day-to-day a -day standpoint because uh, we respect uh, the great wines of the world. And uh, Mr. Zanella, he goes to Champagne often. I try to get to Champagne as much as I can. These are wines we like. It's not about so much what's better. It, it's about showing the differences sometimes. Uh, but when you do this in a in a publicity-seeking way or, or in a, a trade kind of sales way, it can kind of be like, oh, look at this. Isn't mine better? Um it's not the approach yeah, well, we that's really why, take. Yeah, well, that's why you leave it to Som TV. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's a maybe that's a good plan. 
No, I mean, I, the thing is, I, you know what I like? I like conversations. And to be honest, I don't think there's a single thing. Do you think the judgment of Paris hurt Bordeaux? No, it did not. Nobody stopped drinking Bordeaux. And like, the reason I bring this up is a conversation about, you know, the kind of, you know, sorry about the swearing, but the oh shit moment of there's a region in Italy that maybe I didn't know of the word before, but there's a region that is making wine that knocks people's socks off and it deserves to be at any table you're going to drink bubbles at. It's not going to hurt champagne. Champagne is going to be just fine. Like you said, Francia Corte doesn't make enough wine anyway. I just, I like the idea of it because, well, doing sparklers, I think my entire crew was half of which had been to this region with me filming. The other half had not had it before. And that's a, that's a stark thing to say when we drink a lot of wine. People were really blown away, honestly. We, we were careful with the wines that we put in sparklers because we wanted to stand by what, you know, watchers would want to buy. But I would say yours was a no-brainer. And we privately – this is not – I'll get in trouble for saying this. But we privately rated the wines that we had. And we had Krug and Ruinart and we had the best of the best in sparkler season one. Um, which was James Beard nominated, by the way. <laughs> and um, but you know w- your wine was up there without a question. I have no, I have no reason to say this other than it's just a fact. And so I, I wonder at what level are the rest of producers in Francia Corta compared to Cotal Bosco? Is everybody sort of trying to do this type of level of wine? You know, there, there's a lot of producers, and and the thing is, we have 120 or so producers right now. Uh, it's important to note the the aspect of having the, these producers is a little different um, with only one exception, really everyone else is a grower focused producer. You know, we don't have such a, a situation. We don't have co-ops in French Accorda. We don't have any big bank owned uh, wineries that make tons of wine. Uh, we don't even have that many growers who grow grapes who don't make wine. Uh, almost everyone grows all their own grapes like Carabosco's fully estate. And that's, that's usually the case, but most of these producers only produce Mm, a few thousand cases at most. So we're talking 10, 20, 50,000 bottles. So we don't even see them here. Oh, no. I think of the 120, total imported into the United States is less than 40 for sure. And once you move away from the small little bits imported into like New York or or San Francisco, you're probably talking about 10 or 15 producers who are, are even available to most of the country at some level. And we're still talking about relatively small quantities. I, I don't know if the other producers would agree that they're chasing Cotal Bosco. I mean, everyone would agree that Cotal Bosco is definitely a leader in quality in the region. That, that's, that's not something to be really in debate. But there are other great producers. And often, they're quite different stylistically. The Cotal Bosco style is very much about purity. We do a lot of things to make sure that what was grown in the vineyard is what you see in the bottle and in the glass. Um, so in many ways, we're, we're intervening in things. But in many ways, we're doing intervention that takes our hands off in, in kind of unique ways. Other producers take more classic approaches. You know, there are other producers who work very oxidatively, if you will, uh, who use lots of barrel fermentation on, on all of their different cuvées, who age in the bottle longer uh, because they're looking for more of this uh, lazy, uh, if you will, Krug-like character yeah, yeah. in, in every part of their wine. Yeah, kind of little bit of oak whisper, that whole thing. Yeah, and I'm not saying that they they think of this in a way like they're trying to emulate that producer. Just for the general audience, that would be the the style I'm referencing. Well, and, if you're going to emulate thing, somebody, Krug's not too bad of an emulation. It's, you uh, could definitely do worse, that's for sure. <laughs> what I would say is that um, many producers do uh, focus on the lease contact in a way that uh, we don't at Carabosco. Our wines are all aged for quite a long period of time. Ana Maria Clemente, you tasted. That wine was on the lees in the bottle, uh, aging for nine years before disgorgement, the one you had on Sparklers. That's Guys, not an insignificant this wine, time. this wine is ridiculous. It is so good. I I, uh, I I hate to gush, but it really is a really, really tasty wine. We we also had it, you know, we did our company dinner um, not long after, sort of between, remember we filmed part of Sparklers at one point and then went to part of it in Sonoma and we had a company meeting and that was the sparkling we poured instead of a champagne, instead of, and I will say across the bottom, it is a hell of a food wine. Across across the whole spectrum, we had it with a number of different things and the fact that it's aged, one of my favorite things that people may disagree with but I don't is that cured meats with sparkling wine is one of my favorite things to eat in the world. And I think that Francia Corta is, is a very interesting, and I'll, and I'll 
with you guys sort of as the North Star is a really interesting wine to have because the acid and that kind of wheezy quality of it is very much in balance where some wines, you know, it pushes really hard one direction and that's good for certain foods. I find that this Ana Maria Clemente and also your Brut are really positioned from a food standpoint. Exactly. I, I think it it's, was it's integral. We, we definitely think of these wines as, you know, not just something that you have as an aperitif, as a as something to start the evening off as a cocktail. Uh, our wines, and, and most wines in Italy, I mean, it, it would be a classic trope that an Italian will tell you uh, that you should be having food with whatever you're drinking. Uh, yes. But specifically with the wines of Carabosco, they are very much seeking balance. Um, we're seeking this character that shows off what, what came from the vineyard, and we try to, to put our hands on it as little as possible. So... With like Anna Maria Clementi, it, it does work really well with, it, it has this immense amount of lees contact. It is fermented in barrel, but what you get is you get that balance, as you said, of acidity and the fruit with the lees. It's not dominated by just bready, toasty, leesy character. It's not so stark in its acidity that it's, it's austere and you can't get past that. What you have is this kind of, of round and rich character that you mentioned charcuterie. Yeah. Like really kind of, of intense meat kind of flavors. One of the best pairings I've ever had with Anna Maria Clementi was actually like A5 Wagyu, you know, really fatty beef, small little pieces. It's just this indulgence, but the the texture, the coating, the way that that, that meat sits on your, your tongue and the way that the Anna Maria Clementi both cleanses it and works with it, it's not something you would say is classic, but in a, in a certain way, maybe it should be. It's it's a really dynamic pairing and it's, it's a way of I don't enjoying know. these I wines think, beyond... Think... I think sparkling with age on it is fantastic with steak. I mean, I, I don't, I don't mm-hmm. think, you know, I know uh, geeks like you and the Somalia community are like big advocates of exactly that sparkling wine with age and meat. <laughs> I, I've seen it happen. You know, tech Som and, you know, food and wine classic and Aspen. I mean, this is what Soms are ordering. So I see it, but I, is there, this is, this is just your opinion. Is there a chip on the shoulder of people in Francia Corta in regards to champagne or, is this pretty much like you guys feel like we have our identity? We don't feel like we have to, you know, I just wonder what it's, what it's like to have to, you know, you're not in the shadow, but does it feel like you are? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think anyone feels that way. Um, it really helps when every producer sells out of every bottle of wine they have every year. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to feel like, Oh, what should I be doing different? Uh, clearly the, the consumer the market is, is, you know, valorizing, uh, what, what people are making. And I would say that almost everyone in Franciacorta I've ever talked to is, is tremendously proud of the identity Franciacorta has. Um, you know, Franciacorta, even as a, as a DOCG, it was the first DOCG in Italy for traditional method wines, but it, it did a lot of things throughout its history to, to really refine and, and get back to this identity standpoint. When you look at the front label of a bottle of Franciacorta, there's one thing that you won't see on it that you'll see on every other DOCG bottle of wine in Italy is that you won't see a reference to that DOCG. It was actually legally removed from the front label because the notoriety of Franciacorta domestically is so high that it's it's superfluous, essentially. There's, of course, the tax stamp on the, the top of the bottle or such, the sticker, but on the front label, you won't see that. You also won't see the reference to traditional method, you know? In every other region of France that makes bubbly wines, you're going to see a reference to to the method of production. To almost every other sparkling wine in the world, you're going to see a reference to the production. Only in Champagne and French Accord will you see no reference to that. Um, while it is not well, seen why? as often what's in America. The, what's the decision for that? I mean, it seems like you'd want that stuff just from a marketing standpoint, no? No, because I, I think champagne got away from it because everyone knows it's champagne. They know champagne is bubbly and, and this is what it is. The majority of the people who buy French Accorda already know that. Now, the That's majority right. of Americans might not. They might not immediately associate that. But but the majority of the consumer for French Accorda is Italian and they, they know French Accorda to be uh, basically their bubbly wine. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Is there any plan to do any kind of still wine? At all? Do you guys do any still wine? Yes, we're actually one of the the few producers who really focus on the highest tier of of still wine, the highest quality level. You see, I've never had it. Does it even see the United States? I haven't had it. A few hundred cases of a couple of our wines. But about 20% of the production, well, but 20% of our production at Carabosco is still wine. Our region, like I said, has only been doing bubbles since the 1960s. But we've been doing still wine for, well, literally 
back to the Roman times. Uh, there are records. I mean, this has always been producing wine in this region. Uh, and interestingly, for a few hundred years, has actually been doing grapes that you don't traditionally associate with a place known for bubbles. Um, they were often making grapes blended from Bordeaux grapes with indigenous Italian grapes. So if you were to find a bottle of wine from the 19, let's just call it 20s or 30s or some time period like this, it probably would have had Cabernet, definitely probably would have had Merlot, might have had Barbera or some other local grapes in, as a blend. So we have a DOC for uh, still wines that shares a, a contiguous boundary with Franciacorta. That's called Curte Franca. And Carabosco uses that DOC for our white wine, which is 100% Chardonnay. Uh, it was the very first. <laughs> Jacob, yeah. this is why people study, studying Italy right now are hemorrhaging. They're sitting there and oh. they're, <laughs> they're listening in their car and they're going, I am about to have an aneurysm because of Italy. <laughs> it's, it's so hard. People, do, this is why it's so wonderful, but also so stressful to try to understand the wines of Italy. It's exactly what you're saying right now. Yeah, but it's you know, so, we never, we never change the laws in Italy. They just stay the same forever. I'm kidding. Well, Clearly, that changes every I was other day. Say, everyone else, they just they just threw up in their <laughs> no, mouth. Everyone studying. <laughs> exactly. No, they they're it, the Italian wine laws really represent the country well because it's it's always in a state of flux and it's always kind of uh, many things at the same time. So, for instance, the the very first Chardonnay uh, barrel fermented and made in Italy in the the style of say the great wines of Burgundy was made at Carabosco in 1982. We even had a very famous American who helped Maurizio Zanella make some of the first vintages of our still wines in the 1980s. So Andrei Chelichev became a great friend of Maurizio, and he, uh, in a friendly kind of consulting way, before he started Ornolaya, worked with us for a number of vintages on our still wines specifically. Kind it's of incredible crazy, how right? this person has been so – he touched so many wineries – um, I, it's just an incredible thing to think about Chalachev and how important he was on a world scale. Clearly, it's not just Napa. You know, I mean, what an amazing, absolutely, what an amazing, yeah. uh, uh, a Russian chain smoker somehow found his way <laughs> into every wine region in the world. As far as uh, what an what an amazing guy. We have more yeah. lots of coming on him on Sam TV. We'll get to that later. Yeah, um, he, he he was a very dynamic person and a. Uh, very important yeah. to us, too, for the, those few years. Uh, we couldn't pay quite as much as Ornelia, so in 85, he stopped working with us. <laughs> uh, quite reasonable. But uh, we've made those wines. Um, one of our most popular still wines is based on Cabernet Sauvignon. It's named after our founder, Maurizio Zanella. It has his signature on the bottle. And it's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Originally, when that first wine was made, the Cabernet Franc we got actually wasn't. <laughs> we got it so from a nursery. So what do you, what do you call that? A, su a super Brescian? I mean, what is oh. that? Like, it's not a super Tuscan. What do you? What is that? What is that idea of what is that kind of wine called? Uh, we 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 call it uh, just what it is. It, everyone wants to put the term super in front of another region after Tuscan right. made it so so successful. But I think it's a little silly to be a super Veronese, a super Lombardy, and I. I think that you just have to, to respect that these wines actually have a lot more history than just copying Tuscany. You know, Cabernet Merlot have been in our region for quite literally a couple hundred years. Uh, some of the oldest Cabernet in Italy is in the Alto Adige and in Friuli. I mean, it's, it's not something you would expect, but people migrated across Europe and they brought their grapes with them at various times in history. And these grapes, while we associate them as being French or international, etc., they have been in these places, maybe not the majority, but but there. So, like that wine does see uh, a bit of new oak influence. It, it is made in the reminiscent style of say say Bordeaux might be more than say California, um, but it's it's really just a, a wine that we don't we don't add such a moniker to. We treat it as as Maurizio Zanella, in fact, and um, it's it's really a very special wine, but we do get such a, a small quantity in America that we don't we aren't able to share it as often as we'd like. What are what are the chances I can get a bottle, Jacob? Because <laughs> I'd love to try it. I'm I'm sure I can make that happen for you, Jason. Well, I would love that. We were just we were just at uh, the Food and Wine Classic, and one of the really fun things was to. I know this sounds like I'm like name dropping, but to taste a bunch of wine with NBA players while we were there, and I will tell you the Italian in quotes, super Tuscan idea, you know, are their favorite wines. I mean, it's, it was astounding to hear what they love to drink and what's being pushed. I, I Honestly, I think you're on the right track, even though it's been 200 years you've been on it, 
or 300. Yeah, but. <laughs> and, and that wine we've made since 1979. So it's, it's not one of our newer wines. Yeah, that's great. I, w- I, I cannot wait to try it. I, I hope it, to try the second vintage, 70. I want to try 80. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Uh, 80 was good. 81, not so good. So okay. what is important to note too is that you, you think of, we make still Chardonnay, we make still Pinot Noir, but what we're not doing is just taking the same grapes that would go in Francia Corda and then say letting them ripen longer. This isn't the the ice vine model of making still wine for, for a sparkling wine region. When we make still wine, it's from different vineyards in different parts. There's, for instance, for Chardonnay, we have a vineyard in the far eastern part of, of Francia Corda uh, in an area called Chilatica. And this vineyard only produces Chardonnay for still wine for us. The, that vineyard would never go into a bubbly wine, even though it's Chardonnay from within the Francia Corda boundaries, because it's it's planted to a different um, spacing density than we we like for bubbly wines. It's different clones that were chosen specifically to be for, for the still wine. And and the, the aspect of this vineyard, the situation that it's in, when we do still wines, it's in a dedicated way. It's not as an afterthought or a, hey, this vintage was too ripe, so we couldn't pick these vineyards for bubbly wines. We're going to do it for still wines. When we do them, they are they are always going to be what they are. They're not an afterthought. So something that is, I think, kind of common in most regions, but when you're thinking of a bubbly region that does this, it's kind of important to go beyond that that step of just letting them ripen longer. That's incredible. I, you know, one of the things I think is really exciting about Francia Corta and this region of Brescia and everything is people are starting to travel again for wine. They want to go places. They want to see things. And I am a huge advocate of, yeah, you can go to Napa. Yeah. You can go to Bordeaux. Yeah. You can go to these places. I mean, even Champagne, honestly, I'm a huge advocate of going to someplace that you wouldn't have planned to go to. And so what I want you to do as we end this is make a pitch to visit this region instead of going to say Tuscany. Can you make a pitch to people listening that they should visit Brescia, Francia Corta, and actually be in this spot? What would be the reason to go there? There's there's a lot of reasons. And one is that you can still do a lot of what people want to do in Italy. When people go to Tuscany and they're in Montalcino, they wanted to go to Rome, which is a few hours away. They wanted to go to Florence, Siena, these historical cities that they've dreamed of seeing the museums and et cetera. Well, in the north, you think of Venice, uh, if you're going to go to a major city for for tourism and, and historical things, maybe Verona. But Milan is, is a really great city in and of itself. It has some of the most amazing architecture you'll see, some amazing food. I mean, all of Lombardy has amazing food that is a, it really it's still a bit of a secret, which maybe that's their, their plan. But uh, there's some amazing dining. You can see The Last Supper before you have one of the greatest dinners of your life. And you can drive an hour over to Francia Corda. As you leave what is essentially suburban Milan, you end up in Francia Corda, which is how we at Carabosco ended up in Francia Corda. It was the family's house in the woods, the house outside of the city. And as you come into Francia Corda, you're genuinely going from being in a city to a wine region. And, and that the difference really does strike you in a particular way. The region's really small. It's not Napa Valley. We only have about hmm, ten or 12,000 people that live in Francia Corda. We only have maybe, I don't know, 10 hotels, a few hundred hotel rooms total. Uh, that if you're going to visit us, it, it, it's something that you're going to do in a more boutique kind of way. It's, it's more like visiting Mendocino than Napa, if you will, without having to drive quite as far. So you can experience some of the best wines, I think, in Italy. You can have great, great dining. And you really don't have to, to push yourself from a driving or a, a, a transportation standpoint too far outside of what you might already be doing. On the plus side, too, one of the few cities you can fly direct into Italy from, from the U.S., is Milan. You rent a car. Uh, not too many better ways to, to deal with jet lag than rolling right on over to Cato Bosco. Uh, you guys, th- that was a great pitch. I mean, I, I want to go right now. I will say this. This If you want to actually drink with the person making the wine, the people who own the winery, their asses on the line for what you are drinking and smiling at them for, there's no better thing in the wine world than doing that. And there are so many regions where you can go and taste, and the person tasting you on the wine doesn't even know the owner. This is not one of those regions. That is why, and on top of it, the wine is so badass. I'm I'm, I'm only here advocating it because... If you are trying to think, look, wine is unobtainable. I can't get access to things. 
you need to look at the regions like Francia Corta, which Jacob, at some point in our life, we're going to look back and go, damn it. It's expensive. And it was, you know, it deserved to be, but right now you guys, it's magic hour. Get your butts to Francia Corta and drink these wines and eat this food because you will be the happiest people I know. Jacob, it's a pleasure to have you on the pod and even more so Thank you for believing in sparklers. And we are so honored to have had you in the first season. I hope that we do it again for real. Jason, it's my pleasure. What you do at Som TV and your whole team are fantastic. It's it's really our pleasure to work with you. Uh, we are we are big fans. Thanks everybody for listening. Do not forget we have tons and tons of things coming to Som TV, of course. We are still rolling out our blind tasting sessions new season from the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen. Uh, some of the great sommeliers, winemakers, and just all-around personalities are in this season. It's really, really, really wonderful. And uh, we want you guys to share in uh, the debauchery that we had on the ground there. So go to SomTV.com, $49.99 for an entire year, and look out for our closer look at Francia Corta to learn more about this region. If you are not drinking Francia Corta more often, then uh, you should. All right, everybody, please be safe and uh, drink sparkling wine. Why not? All right, everybody. Talk soon.